What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Love Unscripted Podcast. I'm your host, Joseph Wilson, and I'm joined as always by my esteemed co-host, Dexter J. Tucker. What's going on, fam? How y'all feel? And this is the podcast where we have unscripted conversations with millennials about relationships and dating. So I just want to thank everybody for continuing to rock with us, continuing to follow, continuing to just have these talks that are very meaningful about dating and relationships. So Dexter, how are you doing so far this week? We're about to go into a new week. How are you feeling so far? I feel good, man. I feel good. Work's been pretty good. Um, can't can't wait till you know the next following week to be more productive, but it's been good. How about you? Yeah, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, uh in Tennessee, we have like a cold front come through, so man, it's we do much too. more chilly than I was expecting. I thought I started pulling out the shorts. I went and pulled the bin out. I was like <laughs> I don't pull the shorts out, but it quickly told me it's still sweatpants and hoodie weather. So uh, that's how we're doing here. So if this is your first time listening to us, we just want to welcome you. We're an unscripted podcast where we just have conversations with people our age range about dating and relationships. And we do that because a lot of the information that we have in our own personal unique circles, we need to be able to get that out and to share it with other people. So last week, we had a really good conversation about being trustworthy. There's a lot of people who have been hurt out here in the dating and relationship scene, and it can be difficult to get back out there and trust again. So episode 82 is actually called Don't Trust Chameleons. If it sounds weird, just go listen to that episode and you'll get the reference. So that's what we talked about, trustworthiness. But we're going to move on to a new episode. We're in a new week a new day. And we have another great guest who is going to be joining us for this conversation. So let me go ahead and get them in here. All right, sir. So go ahead and introduce yourself for us. Uh, what's going on? My name is Joe Von J. Palmer, author, entrepreneur, uh, part-time entrepreneur and um, full-time employee, social worker by day, entrepreneur by night. I am a coach who I help individuals who have been sexually molested or sexually traumatized um, heal in relationships. I want you to you know, be able to trust again. I want you to be able to really just release all that suppression. So that's what I do. Um, that's who I am. I also got a clothing line. I am the blessed. So if you look at the Living Single logo, a little spin on it and just put the blessed part because um, it's, a, it's a blessing that I made it out of my situation, man. It's a blessing that I'm able to live and tell the truth, you know, to really just walk in my truth. So that's where that clothing line stem from. That's the meaning from it. It's just, you know, the blessing for me is just not it's nothing tangible. It's nothing, um, you know, monetary. The blessings that I'm living, I'm a living testimony. Man, that's great. And I'm glad yeah. you're here with us. I told you guys I like to have real authentic people. And he has a great story that we're going to get into. But first, let's get to know him a little bit better. So he said uh, in the little pre-meeting that I could ask personal questions. And this has actually made a lot of people nervous. So I'm going to ask it to you I, anyway. Anyway. Ask- so what are some shows that are on your Netflix playlist? People have asked, like, have have looked at me as if I had asked what is in their photo album on their phone. They have, like, paused. I've seen the deer eyes. I've had to shift and pivot the question. Yeah, but since yeah, you're yeah. going to answer, what is on your Netflix playlist? That's hard to answer, not because, like, I don't want to share, but it's more so I don't watch much TV. I don't have much time to watch much TV. Um. I can give you one that's on Hulu. I've been watching Snowfall lately. Um, mm. Aired at first sight. I don't care. It's on Netflix though. Uh, I'm just gonna give you those two for now. It's already been watching. I, I really have much time to watch TV, so that's what that's what I have right now. Okay, Snowfall. That's that's the show right now. That's yeah, that's that's yeah. my show right now. Sure. Definitely digging Snowfall. So here's another question: What is something that? we did before the pandemic hit that you can't believe we were actually doing um not washing our hands <laughs> Bro, Isn't that i've never seen so many people talk about well, i gotta wash my hands wash my hands so much and i'm like you should have been doing that should have been mean, doing you that you should have been, been using protection i mean i've seen like a lot of uh, pandemic babies popping up so i'm like all this stuff that we're doing, you know, only thing I think that we probably haven't been doing is wearing a mask. But outside of that, like we should be doing all this stuff, you know, protect ourselves and our loved ones. 
Right, right. And you know what's funny? So before I started working in the school as a therapist, I did oh. in-home therapy. Or, so I was always with my little hand sanitizer, my mm -hmm. mic. I wasn't touching people's stuff. I wasn't putting my hand in my face. I had my own pens and pencils. I had yep. everything to myself. Yep. Mm -hmm. and so I feel like I was almost prepared for this this whole time. Oh, definitely. So, so, so here's another thing that I, a lot of people, um, I get to know a little bit more. So what is your favorite drink? What drink just is like very comforting? You enjoy it. If you had if you had an opportunity to drink it every day for the rest of your life, you probably would. What would that drink be for you? So my sister just got me hit the Starbucks. I've never been a Starbucks fan at all. Mm. And um, this joint's called the Refreshers. Yes. The refresh. Yes. I don't know. It's like when you drink that joint, you just feel refreshed, like for real, for real. Like that joint just hits you. Like it's like hit your soul. Oh, um, see, so yeah, right now the Starbucks refresh is like my, uh, my go tos right now. I don't go often, but like if I if I'm at Starbucks, that's what I'm getting. Mm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So that's a little bit about our guest today. Hopefully, you guys were able to connect a little bit through the the listening audio ways. But we're gonna go ahead and jump right into this topic. We're not gonna do a love it or shove it today because I do want to spend time on this topic and have a full opportunity to discuss it. Yeah. And so, it's this we're gonna talk about sexual trauma. And normally, I like to have a little build up to the topic, but with this one, I just want to go ahead, say it, and name it because yeah. I think it deserves a lot of attention and because it's not discussed head on right. as often as it should be. Um, as a therapist, I've often encountered people who are ex who have experienced se sexually traumatic events, mm -hmm. but are not able to verbalize it. Or when it happens in families, everyone talks around it and does not say what it is exactly. Yeah. So I wanted to just say, we're talking about sexual trauma. So first question, what would you consider sexual trauma to be? How would you define that? Um, it can be defined a, <clears throat> a lot of ways. You know, of course, you know, what we know it to be is actually, you know, the physical portion of it. But there's mental sexual trauma. You know, there's, you know, physical sexual trauma. So like for the mental piece, it's just you may have seen something at an uh, early age that you probably something you should have never seen. Like I was introduced that to porn at a very early age that I should not have been introduced to. And it led to a porn addiction. I was, you know, molested at the age of 12, like around 12, the 11, 12 was like a lot of stuff I was introduced to stuff that I was, should never been introduced to as a kid. So molested at 12, introduced to porn at 12, um, you know, so you see stuff mentally, that stuff that it just stays and it plays in the back of your mind. The physical part, of course, you know, you don't like being touched a certain way. You don't like being, you know, looked at a certain way. You don't like being around certain people because you just can't, you know, those, those feelings still overcome you sometimes. So it's, Mental and physical. It's just it's not just, you know, just the one we think of here. Oh, somebody's been touched. No, it's more than that. Like if somebody's talking to you the wrong way, like as a kid, you know, you're talking like, you know, it's a grown man are talking to a grown man. Women is talking to a kid very dirty or whatever. That stuff sticks to that person. And we don't realize it because we have a subconscious that a lot of us don't tap into. And that subconscious is a powerful thing and it's also a dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. And what's so funny is you mentioned it's not just always physical. It's the viewing of things. Correct. People would be surprised how traumatic porn can be for children whose mind are developing and cannot process what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. That's really sure. traumatic. And it, it shapes a lot of their it reshapes and gives false definitions to things. Right, right, right. I'm glad that you brought it up. I think Dexter had a question he wanted to ask. Oh, for sure. So, um, so if you think you may have experienced like a sexually traumatic event. But you're not sure. Like, what would you do next to find out that that's what it was? I would open my mouth and talk to somebody. That's one thing I wish I did a long time ago. Is open my mouth and ask somebody. Um, just so I can get the process started a lot sooner than I did because I didn't start therapy until 28, 29 years old. Wow. You think from 12 to 29, you know, you're dealing with so much and you don't understand. Like I said, I was introduced to porn, and you know, now I had wound up growing to into a more. Lessons. So I want to, you know, grow into so many other things that we're going to get into later in the podcast that I just wish I would have had the courage or somebody just had the courage to ask me, are you OK? What's wrong? Or just saw that one thing that was wrong with me and allow for me to acknowledge that I'm OK. And then let's say, cool. since we're acknowledging what's going on, what's happened, let's start the process now. So as he gets older, there won't be no more, like, you know, he can heal 
from a younger age growing to an older age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and so were you gonna say something else, Dexter? Yeah, I was gonna say like a lot of like a, so many of us that have been, you know, a victim of sexual trauma, we we suppress it in our minds to make it fit to go about being normal. And yeah. we try to suppress it so we can move past it. Like we know it's not normal. We know it's not okay. Something in us innately is like this is not okay, but we just suppress it down because of of the of the person that that did it that showed us whatever because right. oh they didn't mean any harm because they God know them like this this is just one thing that happened and we try to just press past it and move past it not realizing it's it's not okay yeah it's yeah. not okay yeah and and that it it's such a traumatic experiences overall change your brain structure mm -hmm. like it, it doesn't it 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 changes your brain such that it sometimes doesn't view the experience the way it happened. Right. It's almost like it was so bad that your brain tries to create an alternate reality yep. to deal with it so that you can actually be okay. Yeah. And, and yeah. there's so many times where, for instance, I'll be working with a family where the parents will tell me, Hey, this is what I walked in on. This happened. But when I talk, with the teen or someone else about it, like what actually happened, they were like, no, it didn't happen. No, I don't remember that part. But it was so traumatic that their brain literally can take whole chunks of information out, mm -hmm. hide it yeah. so that you're not hurt and create a whole new reality. So if you're out there and you're not sure whether or not you experienced some type of sexually traumatic event, that is okay. Mm -hmm. Because you went through such a horrific event, your brain did something that tries to protect you from it. Right, but right. like you said, there are things that you can do. There are professionals that you can speak with and get in touch with to kind of help you piece through the whole situation. You don't have to do it by yourself. Right. So, so here's another question I have. So... As we get older, like you said, you didn't get to therapy until you're like 28, 29. I'm pretty sure between then you had relationships with people. Um, and in some form or fashion, it, it may have played a part in how you view relationships, how you deal with other people that you're dating or romantically involved with. So how do you think sexual trauma can impact or affect how we actually view and interact or operate within romantic relationships yeah I'm, I'm glad you asked that because when you're intimate with somebody else on that level and you've experienced a sexual trauma that you haven't dealt with it leads you to be at least it's hard for you to just one gain trust because you don't know exactly what's on the opposite side of that individual that you're dealing with it may be you know the opposite sex or even, even with the same sex you know it might be to the point where like you talked earlier, where it's suppression, where we suppress so much inside, so it's hard for us to ex express ourselves. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's always, I'm not an emotional person. And that stems from my trauma. Where it's like, you know, <laughs> some people think, oh, you're a cold. No, it's not that I'm cold. It's just that I'm working on this thing called expressive emotion, where I learn to express myself and feel okay with expressing myself. So we tend to suppress a lot of stuff. We tend to, you know, sometimes we tend to just express ourselves in a sexual way because that's all we know. Mm. So it's like, you know, for me, I express myself in a sexual way when I was trying to force myself to, you know, say, oh, the trauma didn't happen to me or, you know, I'm not attracted to guys or I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm a manly man because that's, I'm, I'm supposed to be that person, you know, and it got to the point where I just couldn't control any of that. And I just kind of just had to, I just had to find a way to release all of it. And the only way I knew how to do it was just reenacting the experiences that happened to me. So once upon a time, you know, I was, you know, dating a bunch of women, couldn't commit to none of them, didn't want to because I just couldn't trust myself in a relationship relationship. So I'm just dating women, you know, in college, as you know, in a sense, just kind of just giving myself away freely. You know, this woman, that woman, this woman, that woman, you know, sleeping with this girl, sleeping with that girl. And then years later, for some odd reason, curiosity hit me and I'm starting to express myself to the same sex. To the point where now it's like, you know, I get to Atlanta where I'm at now and curiosity, you know, that saying curiosity kills, kills the cat. Mm -hmm. Curiosity got the best. So, OK, maybe what I've been suppressing this side is slowly leaking out of me. So let me go say, let me let me go to this side of the world and kind of see what it's like over here. 
So I said, you know, I'm gonna leave the leave females alone. I'm not gonna date any females. You might try to even put me on, but now I'm good right now. That's that was my thing. I'm just good. I'm just gonna live my life. Didn't tell nobody that I just wasn't I wasn't comfortable telling anybody yet. And the crazy thing is to this day, like as I'm sharing my story nowadays, it's like all my homeboys, I'm hungry, like, man, I wish you would have came to me earlier. It ain't gonna be like, you know, I don't look at you no different. You're least my boy. I love you, blah, blah, blah. And it's just, I had to take that time to really just figure out who I am as an individual, as a man. <clears throat> and it just took so much time and it took so much trial and tribulation. And it stems back to me not knowing who I was because I lost my identity as a 12 year old boy. So I'm in search of myself from 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and so on, trying to figure out, trying to escape my thoughts, trying to escape my feelings, trying to escape, you know, myself. And I just had to just, I had to do it. You know, do I live in regret? I try to live in regret because, you know, life happens. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, I'm living blessed, you know, that I'm here to tell this story to them. You know, I'm thankful that, you know, I wasn't the one of people, you know, on TV who got murdered for just being out there. I was like, if you, if you, if you want to be honest and blunt and transparent, I was out there wilding, like wilding, like, you know, my phone was like my, I'm on the phone, like, you know, on these random apps that I just happened to find. Like, you know, when you're like, you know, you know, when you're, when you're trying to find something, you're going to find it. Mm -hmm. That's what happened. I'm like, okay, shoot, let's do it. And it was like in and out, in and out. And, you know, getting myself, of course, you know, getting tested and stuff like that. Cause anybody who's out there, you know, living, you know, down low life has what it's called here. You know, I would say definitely make sure you're getting tested. I was getting tested, you know, taking breathes. Okay. I'm good. Taking can breathe some good. And it was just, I had to choose a side, you know, because eventually, you know, I want to have kids, I want to get married, you know, I want to have a wife and everything. So I was like, I had to like flush myself. I had to prune myself and everything like that. And it took some time. And you know, my therapist like really was the one that gave me that, that, that relief that I needed because like I sat there, I told her, she was like, Oh, that's it. And I'm like, I'm thinking like, it's a, it's a big deal. And she's like, that's it. And I'm like, yeah. She's like, Oh, okay. Well, we're going to get you through it, but you know, it's not that big. You ain't the only person. And those words, they're not the only person set me so free because I realized that I'm not going to be, I may be like, you know, a few that's speaking of it publicly, I'm still not the only person. And so, so sorry to jump in Go into that a little deeper that you're not the only person because as a social worker and mm -hmm. as a therapist, oftentimes people come to us and think that they are the only person who have ever experienced what they're going through. So what was that meant mentally? Like, how did that change how you view things when you realize that it is not just happening to me, but er there are more people out there who are experiencing the exact same thing? It was so liberating um, because I'm like, okay, it's really not just me. And then, you know, when she shared, you know, in therapy, you know, I was thankful because my therapist, she got personal with me and shared some of her life story and stuff like that. And, you know, I start as I start telling my story and I'm telling my story to friends, I'm like, they like, yo, like, dang, I appreciate you sharing that because I was in that situation once upon a time too. So it's like, the more I shared my story, the more free it became to not only to myself, but it came free to others. Like, I used to tell the story and stutter all over words, trembles in my, you know, my chest and everything like that, but it's just... Yeah, yeah when you realize that you're not the only person and you know <clears throat> i'm a man of faith and you know the bible tells us you know there's nothing new under the sun and that's including my situation like my situation is no it's no it's not new somebody else you know has gone through that same exact thing somebody else has experienced the same exact thing somebody else has you know gone through exactly what i've gone through and I had to, that's what i had to realize and when that when I realized that and I was able to understand that on a mental level, a physical level, like I'm not the only one, then it gave me the courage, you know, to step out there and to really just start, you know, doing what I do now today. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Because you know, there are so many people, like, and I'm glad you that you said that about, you know, realizing you're not the only one. You know, because a lot of people that deal with sexual trauma, even including myself. Like mm -hmm. you walk around with this shame that yeah. it's your fault. Right. And yeah. yep. if I didn't do this, this wouldn't have happened. Yep. Or maybe I should have done this and this wouldn't have happened. Or or if I tell my parent, you know, they're gonna be upset with me or or mad at me or ashamed of me because this happened, or or, or this family friend or whomever the person was that's that's over you or the person that even did it, you know, you feel this shame and you carry it and you walk around with it. And it, and then later on in life, it just it comes out, you know, in, in some way, form, or fashion. Right, it still right. come out, you know, and it like 
what did you like after you came to the realization that you experienced that sexual trauma like what what did that healing process look like for you because i know a lot of people don't want to know like what happens after you come to grips with it like what does that healing process look like you said it man it's like you come to grips with it uh, you come to terms like you know that it's gonna be okay mm -hmm. you come to terms that you know that you can't live in shame anymore you come to it's like you know you come to terms like you know everything starts to, it just starts to realize that it's not your fault you know you can't as a child especially as a child even or an adult like you mm -hmm. can't blame yourself for yeah. sexual trauma you can't there's no way possible that you can really like when you think about it logically you can't really say the trauma that happened to me was my fault there's no way possible and if you do do that you're living in denial because one you're either trying to protect the person who did it to you or two it's like you know that person who did it to you they probably weren't like they threatened you you're mm -hmm. scared of them so it's like you're still in that denial to the point where you feel like you know what happened to me is my fault, but it's not. So once you realize that, you once you get over that hump, it's just life just gets so much easier when you realize it's not your fault, and you realize the experiences that you know that kind of shaped you. They were there to pretty much shape you into a stronger being because it's like I feel like life just has a way of happening in the way it does, where you have to realize that when trauma happens, there's always something behind you that's going to help you carry you through your trauma. But one, you got to acknowledge your trauma. Two, you got to acknowledge that, you know, it's not my fault. Three, you got to, you know, really step forward and get the help that you need, whether it's from a support group, whether it's from a, you know, I always recommend a licensed professional, especially in the area of trauma, just because it's so much more than just talking and speaking it to a friend. I, you know, that was my problem. I was always going to a friend about my issues to the point where I realized I wasn't really getting the help I needed. I was getting a temporary fix. It was like a temporary high. Like, you know, yeah, you get high for a second and you, mm -hmm. you get buzz or whatever, you're drunk, whatever it may be, or you're just on that temporary high. And then all of a sudden, what happens? You crash again. So I was up and then I was crashing up and I was crashing. And then I said, okay, cool. And then the only reason I was introduced to therapy was because I was working in a group home at the time. And I had to take my kids that I worked with to a therapist. And I was like, I sat in on the session on you. This is dope. So I was like, yo, can I, can I holler at you? <laughs> you know, and she's like, yeah, you know, give my sister, you know, schedule a session. Did that, sat down, you know, the whole typical, I laid on the couch. <laughs> I wanted the full experience. And from that day forward, I realized that it's not my fault and I can't blame myself any longer. Man, that's, that, that's beautiful and so freeing for so many people to know that it's not your fault. Mm -hmm. the, the rationalizing of the situation is one of those trauma responses, yeah. trying to make sense of it. So mm -hmm. real quick, what, give a practical thing that someone can do on a daily basis to, because I know once people realize it, they have a lot of anxiety and they start <laughs> replaying a lot of stuff over and mm -hmm. over. And mm -hmm. their nerves get bad. That's one thing that we know is really common with sexual trauma. Sometimes their nerves, anxiety um, tend to be just their sensory overload all the time. Mm -hmm. What is something that you may have done or that you could offer that could help someone on a daily basis be able to manage those nerves or those um, feelings of high emotions and low emotions? Definitely. So a thing that was for me was I'm a right. I love to write. I love to just express myself. And as a kid, I started off doing poetry. And I didn't realize that my poetry, my writing was going to carry me through the rest of my life. Personally, I don't know, you know, global level like that. I've written, written a book before, but writing was like was my getaway because I felt like, you know, I got to talk to myself. I got to talk to my pen and my pad. I got to get everything from that was in here and out of my off my chest and onto something else. So that was like very liberating. Um, I love hiking. I love nature. So I got away, you know, get away to nature. Um, I picked up meditation. Like one of my things, my therapist said, you know, start meditating. So I started meditating, um, getting some sleep, just simple as that. You know, you think something as simple as going to bed on time and getting some sleep and being well rested allows for you to have clarity in your mind. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just really small, simple stuff that I've done or things that I've been recommending to other people who have been hitting me up. It's like, you know, find something that you love that you can't profit from. And I'm talking, you know, a lot of people, we see, find something we love and we oh, I can turn this into a business. That was me. Hey, I'm just trying to stay busy to, you know, stay away from my mess. But I'm like, okay, what's something that you love, Jovan, that you can, you know, find to be your escape? And it was hiking, it's photography. Um, I just bought a bike. <laughs> so um, I just started bike riding and stuff like that. So it's just finding the simple, finding the simple things in life that make you happy, you mm -hmm. know, 
if you know chewing on ice. You know, it's not good for your teeth, but if you, if you like it, do it. Uh, if you like to shop, uh, I'm not saying put yourself in a specific budget and buy yourself something nice every now and again. A lot of times, I feel I found that people who are in, who been traumatized any in any form of that, um, fashion, they don't do anything for themselves because they feel that they're um, that they're not worthy of. It. Mm-hmm. So, I found my worth, you know, I found, okay, I am worthy to spend a little extra money on myself. I'm, I am worthy to, you know, uh, treat myself out to dinner today, whether it's with a friend or by myself. Cause I love, I love solo dinners. I love solo dates because it's like, I'm learning, I've been learning right now to re-love myself. I'm learning to like, you know, reshape my destiny. I'm learning to reshape, you know, everything that I've been through and start experiencing life and all over again. So it's just writing down what you want to do and just taking action on it and just doing it. Like that's what it is, is just taking action on the things that you want to do because you've been trapped so much inside. You haven't really had to, had life. You had life taken away from you. So it's like, you know, you've been living in fight or flight your whole life. You mm-hmm. know, fight, you know, fight. So it's like now is the time for you to actually do what you want to do and live the life that you want to live in. The simple things is the one things that got me through. Man, that's great. And in the therapy world, we call that self-care. So we're going to go ahead and jump into our seg- the, our last segment, which is called Flip the Script. And okay. Flip the Script is the segment of the show where our guest provides a simple tool or strategy to better manage or deal with a, a challenge that we talked about in the episode. So you ready for your question? Yes, sir. Okay, so someone may be out there listening and they may be coming to grips and finally coming to the realization that they have experienced some type of sexual trauma. Mm -hmm. What do you think that they should do to address their trauma and also get support while they're on their healing journey? For sure. So I'm glad you said this because I actually just posted something like this on Instagram. So I'm going to read off Instagram if that's cool. Um, Cool. So. One was challenge your sense of hopelessness. A lot of times we feel hopeless that, you know, we don't challenge it because we feel like I I just can't, there's no way possible I can get through this. So if you challenge your sense of hopelessness and you actually push yourself beyond what you think you can get through, life gets better. The second one is, you know, cope with your feelings of guilt and shame. A lot of times we just feel like, you know, I can't deal with the guilt and the shame. Like, you know, for me, when I was living my, you know, my life of homosexuality, I was so guilty. I was so shameful of it. I felt like, you know, man, people gonna look at me in a different light. And I'm like, once I've started sharing that story, man, it's just like, and people tell me how much they love me, how much they care for me, no matter what I decide, man, I got your back. So when you share that guilt, you share that shame with other people, life gets better. Um, The next one was, you know, prepare for the flashbacks and the memories. They still come to this day. So you got to prepare yourself, you know, what can you do? And a few things that you can do is, all right, cool, I'm going to stop. I'm going to breathe. I'm going to journal. If your therapist, you know, if you have your therapist on speed dial and they allow for that, I'm going to call my therapist and say, hey, I'm having these moments real quick. Or if you have someone, you know, in your corner of your pocket who says, you know, hey, would you ever need anything, call me. But you don't use them that often because you don't want to use up, you know, your, your daytime minutes with them, call them. Uh, another thing was reconnect with your body and your feelings. Re, you got to re- learn to reconnect with yourself. That's what I had to do. Reconnect with myself. Like, okay, Jovan, you got to love this body that you're in regardless of you know what it was and what it is. And reconnecting with your feelings is, okay, like I said, I'm not a mo- very emotional person, so I got to find, you know, find things that make me emotional and start, you know, learning those emotions again and relearning, okay, what is it like to cry? What is it like to feel? What is it like to love? You know, that type of stuff like that. And the last one is really just like you were talking about that self-care, nurturing yourself, caring for yourself in a way that somebody should have cared for you when you were going through those things. Man, there you guys have it. That is this week's Flip the Script. Jovan, thank you for joining us this week. I appreciate y'all, fellas. So please let everybody know where they can find you on social media. Most definitely. If you look at my name, it's my name, Jovan J. Palmer, um, J-O-E-B-A-N-J-P-A-L-M-E-R. You can find me on all media outlets, um, YouTube, uh, Instagram, Twitter, everything like that. Um, Joey Bond, Jay Palmer. All right. So I will put all his information down in the show notes. So if you're listening in your car, don't go try to hit any of these links. <laughs> Wait, till you get home. Wait till you get home. Wait till you're on lunch break, something, because Dexter's not going to be able to get your insurance needs taken care of. So 
Yo, we just want to thank you guys for rocking with us this week. Please head on over to iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher Podcast. Comment, rate, subscribe on there. If you're in podcast land, go ahead and head on over to YouTube where you can find us at Love Unscripted HD. And that's where you can see the full video for this episode. I just thank you guys for being willing to be vulnerable and willing to go deep into feelings and emotions with us on this episode. Don't forget, get out there, do something for yourself. It's a new day. It's a new week. And don't forget that you matter. We will see you guys in the next one. Peace. Peace